Bitcoin uh, is succeeding. It's succeeding faster than any uh, any monetary economic idea in the history of the world. It's gone from zero to one point four trillion dollars in fifteen years without any support from a company, without marketing, without anything. So, so it's growing. It's going to continue to grow uh, because of the following drivers. One driver is just education information spreads like you said you know 10 million people can watch a youtube video 20 30 years ago if i retired and i taught college and i taught a thousand students a semester and i did it for 20 years you know i might get to 40,000 people now you get that many a week you know while you're sleeping so uh, information is going to spread and as people realize this is a safer better way to protect their wealth to store their life savings and to create wealth. And as companies realize it, you're going to see uh, adoption by individuals, by families, by corporations, by nation states, by governments, by institutional investors. That just happened. That, that is happening right in front of our face. We're watching it every day. There's $100 million or more flowing into the ecosystem. So uh, the second thing that's going to drive adoption is regulation and regulatory clarity as um as regulators like when the house of representatives and the senate vote pro big pro crypto pro bitcoin and if the white house says we are in favor that's sending a signal to the establishment that traditionally is very conservative mm -hmm. And, you know, and people thought, well, it's tulip bulbs. The, the deniers, they go away. The skeptics go, the government's going to ban it. Well, they go away because if the government's embracing it, then the deniers are out of consensus. The skeptics are, you know, are dismissed. And now you're into the traders. Well, should I buy it? Should I sell it? Well, that's a big deal to move from skeptic to trader. And then you get to investors. And eventually, of course, you get to the maximalists that think it's an instrument of economic empowerment. Regulatory signals matter. And we've got 28 spot Bitcoin ETFs active today. They're active in Australia, in Hong Kong. They're active in Europe. They're active in South America. They're active in America. Those things are marketing, legitimizing, and spreading, and they're creating a channel. An ETF is like a website. Like if you have... Um, uh, if you have a restaurant or a museum and you didn't have a website, people have to call you on the phone to get information. It's very inefficient. And then when the web came along, you create your website, you know, museum.com, food.com. I hit the website. I see the menu. I see the location. I get directions. I see the photos. It, you know, maybe I order. Right now, you can't really be a business without a website. You know, you need a website. With ETFs, what ETFs did is they said, well, it used to be you had to go to a mutual fund and you had it took you like six weeks to get KYC with the mutual fund and then you had to study it and then you had to wire them your money and then they invested it. And if you wanted your money out, you had to make a request and you had to wait 30 days and maybe they don't give you your money back. And, you know, it's very complicated and scary and takes a commitment. And when the ETF came along, it was like, oh, you want this? You just punch in those four letters and hit buy. Oh, you change your mind? Hit sell. And, and who wired? Every brokerage in the world, every monitor in the world. It's like you type IBIT, you type FBTC, there it is. So having that ticker is like having the URL, hope.com. It's like all you got to do is say it and everybody immediately is empowered. So those ETFs, they're spreading everywhere in the world and, and you're seeing financial infrastructure get created. And the, what's the impact of the on-ramp? Well, billions of dollars, and then tens of billions of dollars, then hundreds of billions of dollars flow. Companies like MicroStrategies, when we, when we adopt Bitcoin as a treasury asset, we had none, and then we had 250 million, and then we raised 7 billion, and then we bought, and then we had 15 billion. But then people will go and they will short our stock and they will buy 5 billion more. So there might be $20 billion, probably there's $20 billion or something like that of Bitcoin that's that's actually locked down because one company. What happens when the second company, the third company, the fourth company, the fifth company? So, so corporate adoption as a treasury asset drives the price up. Adoption by individuals drives the price up. Adro you know, 
There's company Millennium. They just announced they own $2 billion worth of spot Bitcoin ETFs. That means that some the ETFs had to buy $2 billion mm -hmm. worth of Bitcoin, right? Just one hedge fund. They've got $64 billion, right? As these hedge funds come in, then they drive adoption. So beyond that, you got to keep in mind it's a technology. And so you take out Cash App and look at it. It's all about Bitcoin. Cash App is used by more than 50 million people. And they sell two and a half billion dollars worth of Bitcoin a quarter, 10 billion worth of Bitcoin a year or more via that phone. When companies like Apple and Google and Microsoft, when they build support for Bitcoin into their payment apps, into their mobile phones, into their operating systems, that makes Bitcoin more compelling. That'll drive demand. That'll drive up the price. And, and by the way, all of those are just natural things that the human race is going to do. You mention a driver, which is chaos, chaos and, and inflation in the world. Yes, that's a driver too. The more chaotic the society, uh, the less, if I don't trust the currency, I look for an alternative one. If I don't trust the bank, I look for an alternative one. If you lived in Lebanon right now and you just watched 98% of your wealth frozen by the bank, debased, and then the bank wouldn't give you your money back for 20 years. And I said, well, what do you think about the idea of buying property that's not in Lebanon, that's not in the bank, that keeps go up in value, that you control, and that no one could take away from you? You would think, well, that's, I wish I'd known that five years ago, but like you would swear by it. In those societies, uh, crypto adoption accelerates. Go to Brazil, they had hyperinflation. They remember, they're very pro crypto, pro Bitcoin. And you look at people in Venezuela or Cuba, what else are they supposed to do? But I, I think it's important to make uh, two points. One point is you don't need the world to burn for people to decide that having all their money on their iPhone is a good idea, right? The world doesn't have to burn for you to take photos with your mm -hmm. iPhone. Apple would be successful regardless. It just happens, right, that the more chaotic certain parts of the world are, the more there's a stampede uh, of capital toward the thing that's safe. Everybody would come, everybody would move to the United States with all their money if they could. I'm just curious, how much, they can't. how much leverage do you feel like is in the Bitcoin market? And do you ever worry that maybe with the ETFs buying up Bitcoin, driving up the price, that there is a chance if people over leverage that could cause a flash crash Most of, sorts of the leverage there? is in the crypto market. It's in, it's in all the other altcoins. Like those altcoins are 10x to 100 to 1 levered. And so all the leverages in the altcoins and most of the volatility in Bitcoin comes from the altcoin leverage. Mm -hmm. The Bitcoin market is, isn't is nearly that leverage. People that are buying Bitcoin are buying Bitcoin as a long-term store of value. And so they're generally buying it to hold it forever. But um, there's a lot of speculation in the rest. And you know you can't stop them. It's a free, unregulated market. They do what they're going to do. I'm not discouraged by uh, the the volatility in Bitcoin because the volatility makes it the most interesting asset in the world, and that's what draws all the capital, and that's what draws all the traders, and that's what drives up the demand for it, and that's what drives up the price. So, in fact, uh, the volatility is a virtue. On Saturday night, if you think there's a war, you're going to dump what you can sell, which is Bitcoin. But when you realize there isn't a war, you're going to buy back in and there's going to be massive trading. And people are, people that understand it are going to say, hey, that's part of the asset class just growing and getting more powerful. And people that are afraid of volatility will run from it. But, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin's got a higher sharp ratio. It's got a, you know, and it's got a higher return. It's like, do you want to 5X your money and be on a volatile way? Or do you want to lose all your money in a non-volatile fashion? Or do you want to just 1X your money in a normal volatile fashion. And, and that's, that's uh, an issue of adoption or, or uh, education. But coming back to long-term, long-term, what, what happens is this is an idea whose time has come. It's good technology. So every technology investor and every technology executive is going to recognize that. It makes their company better. It makes their offering, their, their device or their service more compelling. It's good economics, which means that you inject it into your mutual fund or into your fixed income fund or you inject it into your ETF, right? 
you know, Larry Fink runs $10 trillion of assets. On television the other day, he said, our Bitcoin ETF is the most successful ETF in the history of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, people that might not have a different opinion say, this is good business. Why wouldn't it be good business? Because it's the highest quality asset, right? Um, and it's, it's good ethics. You're giving property rights and freedom to 8 billion people. What else does it? So it's got a strong ideological drive. And back to this, the point that I was making is if you live in, a, in Cuba or Africa in a coup, or you live in a hyperinflating economy in Russia or in South America, if you could, you would take all your property, all your money, all your family, you'd pick up and you'd move to America. But you can't. You can't move your property from, from hyper uh, inflation collapse to America. And you can't move your family. There's, there, there are limits to, to immigration and there, there are practical limits. The next best thing is you teleport your money into cyberspace, which is almost better than moving it to America. I'm, I'm moving it into cyberspace outside of the reach and outside of the risk zone of the physical world and the political world and the economic world. That, that's the appeal of Bitcoin right now. But you know what? While we're on the topic, you have to ask yourself, what's the future going to hold for businesses? Because if you ask nine different experts, you're going to get 10 different answers. Bull market, bear market, rates will fall, rates are going to rise a little bit. It'll be really helpful to have a crystal ball. But until that happens, over 40,000 businesses have already future-proofed their business with NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud ERP bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, and HR into one fluid platform. So basically, with just one unified business management suite, you have just one source of truth, giving you all of the visibility and control you need to make quick decisions. And with real-time insights and forecasting, you're peering into the future with actionable data. When you're closing the books in days and not weeks, you're spending less time looking backwards and more time on what's next. So whether you're earning millions or hundreds of millions, NetSuite helps you respond to immediate challenges and seize your biggest opportunities. And speaking of opportunity, right now you could download the CFO's Guide to Machine Learning and AI at netsuite.com slash ice. Again, that's netsuite.com slash iced with the link down below in the description. netsuite.com slash iced. Thank you so much, NetSuite, for sponsoring this episode. And now let's get back to the podcast. 